Beloved, before we dare talk to men and women about God, it's always appropriate first to talk to God about men and women. Let us pray. Eternal God, our fathers, to thee we give thanks this hour, thanking and praising you for this day and all of the rich blessings that you have so graciously and bountifully blessed us with this day. Father God, we pray that you will open our hearts and our minds that we might be receptive to the living word. Help us, O oh God, help us open our eyes so we'll see what you want us to see. Help us to open our ears so we'll hear what you want us to hear. Open our minds so we'll learn what you want us to learn. So you always find us doing what you want us to do and be what you want us to be. It's in your mighty name that we pray. And we place this prayer on the wings of faith and hope, knowing whatever you decide is all right with us. It's in your mighty name that we pray. Let us all say together, Amen, Amen, and praise God. Greetings and salutations are in order for my church family, for my Facebook family, for my YouTube family, Welcome to our midweek Bible study. If you joined us for the first time, we say welcome. If you have joined us for some time, we say welcome back. Someone has sagaciously suggested that dusty Bibles lead to dirty lives. You show me a dusty Bible and I'll show you a dirty life. Sin will either keep you from the Bible or the Bible will keep you from sin. Beloved, we have been embarking on a series of studies in the book called Proverbs. We have entitled this study, this journey, we've entitled it A Pilgrimage Through Proverbs. A Pilgrimage Through Proverbs. Paul, that globe-trotting evangelist from the seaport city of Tarsus, wrote to his young son of the faith, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, around verse number 15, he encourages the man of God to study. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That word and that phrase, rightly divide, is an interesting, intriguing, instructive, and most informative Word. It's an informative phrase. It literally means to lay it out straight and cut it out right. Lay it out straight so you can cut it out right. Beloved, that's been our goal. That's been our, our objective as we study each chapter in the book of Proverbs. That's been our goal. That's been our objective as we study each verse in the book of Proverbs to lay it out right and then cut it out straight so God will be glorified, his son might be magnified, saints might be edified, and sinners might be evangelized. Our study in the book of Proverbs is fueled by Romans 15 and 4, where the Apostle Paul, writing to the Church of Christ at Rome, he declared in the long ago for the here and now, he said, things written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. The question then becomes, beloved, what have we learned? First and foremost, we've learned that the book of Proverbs, the one book called Proverbs, is really three books making up the one book we now know as the book of Proverbs. There are three equally divided sections or segments, even divisions, if you will, to the book of Proverbs. The first the first section, the first segment, deals with moral issues. The first nine chapters deal primarily with moral issues. 
When you talk about that which is moral, you're talking about that which is right and that which is wrong. The book of Proverbs in the chapters 1 through 9 deal primarily with moral issues. There, the wise man Solomon deals with right and he deals with that which is wrong. In chapters 1 through 9, the first section, the first segment, if you will, of the book of Proverbs deals primarily with moral issues. The second section, the second segment, deals primarily with miscellaneous issues. Miscellaneous issues. When we talk about the word miscellaneous, the word miscellaneous has much to do with a mix. It has much to do with a mixture. It has much to do with a variety of issues. In the miscellaneous section, the wise man Solomon deals with a variety of issues in chapters 10 through chapters 19. 10 through 19, the 10th chapter through the 19th chapter deals with miscellaneous issues primarily. The last and final section, which is the third section, the third segment, deals primarily with monarchical issues. In the word monarchical is the word monarch. The word monarch literally points to presidents. It points to prime ministers, potentates, and even parents in some cases. Solomon is speaking on the topic, on the subject of leadership, and he's talking about the fundamentals of leadership to leaders. He is, is interested in quality leadership, and he leaves us with precepts and principles that will lead us to better leadership qualities. Solomon speaks to leaders and he speaks on the topics that would most interest leaders in becoming better leaders, if you will. So the wise man Solomon in chapter 24, which puts us uh, in, the, in the monarchical section of the book of Proverbs, he deals primarily with the topic of leadership. He talks to those who are in positions of authority, in positions of authority. In chapter 24, if you look closely, beloved, you'll discover that in the whole of the chapter um, uh, the 24th chapter of the book of Proverbs, Solomon deals with how-tos. I love this about Solomon because he not only tells us what to do, but he gives us various ways on how to do what it is we're trying to do. So the wise man Solomon deals with how-tos in chapter 24. Uh, for example, in verses 1 through 4, in the beginning, the initial stages of chapter 24, you will discover that he shares with us how to create wealth. He deals, the first four verses of chapter 24, deals with how-tos, and it deals primarily with how to create wealth. In verses 5 through 12, Solomon shares with us how to contemplate war, how to contemplate war, how to deal with conflict. I don't care who you are, what you are, where you are, there are cases and there will be times when you will have to deal effectively with conflict. And Solomon, the wise man Solomon, shares with us how to contemplate war, how to deal with, with conflict. In verses 13 through 14, he transitions 
from how to contemplate war to how to cultivate wisdom. In verses 13 through 14, Solomon shares with us how to use. He shares with us how to cultivate wisdom. In verses 15 through 25, he shares with us how to curb wickedness. How to curb wickedness. Then he transitions, and once again, he transitions focusing in on leadership to address the subject of the law, of law, of law. And he not only deals with the law in verses 26 through 29, but he also addresses the subject of laziness in verses 30 through 34. And that concludes the chapter, the 24th chapter, of the book of Proverbs. So we're in the closing pages of chapter 24. Uh, I believe last uh, time we were together, we concluded our study in verse 25 of chapter 24, which places us at the doorstep of our opening verse today, which will be Verse number 26. Verse number 26. We will commit our study in chapter 24, verse number 26. Notice again, Solomon's, notice again, if you will, that Solomon in verse 26 through 29 deals with law. In verses in verses 30 through 34, Solomon deals with laziness and will conclude chapter 24 in verse number, in uh, verse number 34. Now, let's unpack once again chapter 24, commencing at verse number 26. He talks about the law. Don't miss this. In general, he's going to talk about law in general. But then he's going to talk about four major topics in particular. Let me just share quickly with you the four major topics that he's going to talk about in light of the law. In light of the law. The first major topic he's going to talk about can be found in verse number 26. Verse 26 is all about popularity. He says a word about popularity. In verse 26, Solomon speaks on the topic of popularity. In verse 27, the wise man Solomon focuses in on priorities. He talks about priorities why priorities are important in our lives. He talks about priorities. In verse 28, he's going to talk about the danger of perjury, the danger of lying, the danger of being deceitful under oath. He deals with perjury in verse number 28. Then he closes the, the the addressing the law uh, by sharing with us a word about pardon, the necessity of forgiveness. He talks about pardon in verse number 29. Now, let's read together verse number 26, if you will, in Proverbs chapter 24, verse number 26. Look quickly at verse number 26. Every man shall kiss his lips that giveth a right answer. One more time. Every man shall kiss his lips that giveth a right answer. Now, once again, in Proverbs chapter 24, verse number 26, Solomon speaks primarily about popularity. To appreciate fully 
what Solomon is saying in verse number 26. We must take under consideration, of course, that Solomon's style of writing is oriental in nature. Let me say that again. His style of writing is an oriental style of writing. In other words, you have to remember when you read the book of Proverbs that the book of Proverbs is an Eastern book. It's an Eastern book. So if it's an Eastern book, it's written to uh, the Eastern mindset. Only the Eastern mindset can fully understand an Eastern book. Solomon is writing in the Oriental or Eastern style of writing to, uh, to uh, connect with the Eastern mindset that he was writing to. His audience that he was writing to, his subjects and his sons, were Eastern, had an Eastern mindset. Now, we have to remember that we are uh, nearly uh, half a world away uh, from uh, the Far East, if you will. And therefore, we come to the Bible with a Western mindset. You have to be very careful when interpreting an Eastern book with a Western mindset. Because if you allow your Western mindset to help you interpret an Eastern book, we will often miss what the writer is actually trying to say to us because we come to the book, an Eastern book, with a Western mindset. Solomon is writing to an Eastern, uh, 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 Eastern group of people with an Eastern mindset. So he uses examples. His wording is often Eastern and Oriental in its nature. Therefore, we oftentimes, with our Western mindset, miss what uh, Solomon's original intentionality is in using the words and the phrases that he chose to use. For example, in verse number 26, remember what the wise man Solomon says. He says here, uh, in verse number 26, he says, every man shall kiss his lips that giveth a right answer. This makes no sense if you are coming to the text with a Western mindset. But the Eastern mind would certainly pick up on the phrase, uh, uh, you would want to kiss uh, the lips of one who giveth a right answer or a correct answer to a problem or to a question, if you will. Now, what is Solomon saying in our vernacular? What is Solomon saying if we had to word it for the Western mindset? Uh, Solomon is literally saying, um, today we will put it this way, everyone would like to shake the hand of the person who gives a correct answer to a difficult problem or to a difficult question. Everybody would want to be seen with the person shaking their hand of the person who is able to give a correct a right answer to a difficult problem or a difficult question. Or we might put it this way, everyone would like to give a round of applause to those who answer correctly a difficult problem or a difficult question. Or we would love uh, to give a standing ovation, if you will, uh, for the man or woman who gives a right answer or the man or woman who hits the nail on the head. That's a Western idiom, if you will. We fully understand uh, when one says uh, hitting the nail 
on the head. You're right on uh, the situation, if you will. Most of us can appreciate a word fitly spoken when it's fitly spoken. Now, listen to this. The proper response, beloved, to a difficult problem is always welcomed by the wise person. The wise person can always appreciate when someone answers, when someone responds fitly to difficulty, to difficulty. Now, once again, the key to understanding here is cultural. It was a cultural uh, uh, situation that Solomon was alluding to or referring to, if you will, in verse number 26, in verse number 22, verse, in verse number 26, in verse number 26, he's talking about a cultural response, a cultural response. Now, listen very carefully. There are different, different um, uh, ways, uh, different norms, if you will, uh, uh, from the Eastern way of doing things and the Western way of doing things. When people meet and greet in the West, we extend the hand. We extend the hand out of respect. We are, uh, or appreciation, if you will, we will extend our hand and shaking hands in the West is the way to respond to a person you're meeting or a person you are greeting. Not so in the East. They do not extend their hands. They extend their cheeks. They extend their cheeks and they kiss the left side and then kiss the right side. So they embrace, they show appreciation, they show respect out of extending the cheek and not the hand. So that's what the Bible talks about when it talks about a holy kiss. They did not shake hands uh, during the first century of the church. So what would they do? When they met one another, when they meet and greet one another, they would extend the cheek and they would kiss each other on the left, then on the right. And that's what the Bible talks about when it talks about a holy kiss. The holy kiss is an expression of extending the cheek so you can uh, kiss the left side of the cheek and then the right side of the cheek and then you would embrace. That's how they met one another. That's how they would greet one another. That's how they would meet one another. So Solomon is really saying that if you are from the West, you would want to shake the hand of the person who responded correctly or responded in a right fashion, if you will. But since he was writing to an Eastern mindset, he says everybody would want to kiss because remember, they extend the cheek, not the hand, to uh, show respect and appreciation. So here, the wise man Solomon is speaking of a cultural way of meeting and greeting one another by extending the cheek or giving a kiss, if you will, a kiss on the left cheek, a kiss on the right uh, cheek. This was a sign, this was a symbol, this was a way of showing affection and respect. So in verse number 26 has much to do with popularity. In verse number 27, Solomon once again, he's going to transition. And remember when I use the phrase transition, it literally means to stop talking about one thing to start talking about another thing. So here, Solomon is about to stop talking about popularity 
so he can start talking about priorities. So he can start talking about priorities. Notice, if you will, embedded in the word priority is the word pride. The word pride. Now, this word means something, uh, the word prior uh, means something that comes before everything else. Um, uh, something that comes before um, everything or everyone else. So a priority is something that should come before everything or anything else. Look at verse 27 and let's read together verse number 27. That's in the 24th chapter of the book of Proverbs, verse number 27. In verse number 27, prepare thy work without, and make it fit for thyself in the field, and afterwards then build thine house. One more time for emphasis. Prepare thy work without, make it fit for thyself in the field, and afterwards build thine house. Build thine house. Now, here in verse number 27, Solomon is giving us some sound advice. That's what Solomon is doing in verse number 27. The wise man Solomon is giving us some sound advice. Solomon is simply saying, be willing to work for what you want and to save and be willing to save for what you want. You have to first be willing to work for what you want, and you have to be willing to save for what you want. The idea here is that before a house can be built, there must be proper preparation. Don't miss this. There must be proper preparation Proper preparation must be made if you're talking about seriously building a house. You must build a house can only be built once you have pro proper preparation. Proper preparation must be made. In other words, do nothing without a plan. You can accomplish no thing. You can accomplish nothing if you don't have a plan, if you don't have a plan. You see, some people like to skip the planning. They like to skip the preparation part and go right into building without preparing. This kind of foolishness, beloved, God will not bless. If you don't take the time to properly plan, to make proper preparation, your plan will not work. It will not come to fruition. It will not happen if you will. Work your plan, but you can only work your plan after you plan your work. If you want your plan to work, you have to plan your work and then work your plan. Nothing can be accomplished without proper Preparation. That's what the wise man Solomon is trying to tell us. And I believe that's some wise, practical advice for us. If we don't take the time to plan our work, then our plan will not work. You've got to be willing, here it is, to plan your work, then be willing to work your plan. If you're serious about building anything, building a house, building a movement, you must keep first things first. Proper preparation is a necessity for anything of value to work. Anything of value to work. Now, watch this. He's about to transition once more from uh, verse 27 to verse 28. Once again, Brother Pastor, please tell us what this word transition means. It means to stop talking about one thing, to start talking about another thing. So Solomon was talking about priorities, the importance of planning 
and the importance of preparation. Now he's going to transition from talking about priorities to say a word about perjury. That's what he's going to discuss in verse number 28. Let's turn quickly to, to Proverbs chapter 24, verse number 28. Look at verse number 28, if you will. In verse number 28, be not a witness against thy neighbor without cause, and deceive not with thine lips. One more time for emphasis. Be not a witness against thy neighbor without a cause, and deceive not with thine lips. With thine lips. Do not be a witness against your neighbor, uh, especially without a just, a good, or a righteous cause. Without a righteous cause. Now, I want you to notice that the emphasis that Solomon puts on this phrase, do not, that shows us in no uncertain term that this is not some friendly suggestion that we should not do this. This is a direct, this is a divine command from Almighty God. Do not do it. That's what God says. Don't do it. You pay an awful price if you go ahead and do what God says not to do. When God says not to do. First, Solomon, once again, shares with us wise counsel. He uh, advises us, he counsels us not to volunteer. Don't be so quick to volunteer to be a witness against a neighbor. Foremost, that's the first thing. He shares with us that he advises us, he counsels us, don't be so quick to volunteer to be a witness against your neighbor, especially if what you have to say is not valid, it's without a cause, it's not right, it's not just, it's not right just. Don't be so quick to fall in line to be a witness against your neighbor. That's the first thing Solomon wants us to get. The foremost thing I believe Solomon wants us to get uh, in verse number 28 is the fact that we need to learn how to mind our own business. That's what I believe Solomon is suggesting to us. Get you some business. If you don't have some business, get some business because you need to leave other people's business alone. That's the counsel, that's advice coming straight from the lips of the wise man Solomon. Don't be quick to be a witness against your neighbor. And number two, learn to mind your own business. I believe that's some good advice. That's some good advice. Mind your own business and don't be so quick uh, to witness against your neighbor. This word from Solomon does not come to us again as some friendly suggestion. You and I must take these words as a direct and divine command from the lips of Almighty God Himself. Almighty God uh, Himself. Solomon wants us to know in no uncertain terms uh, that we should never speak against a neighbor without a valid cause, without a good reason, without a just reason, without a righteous reason. Don't use your mouth to deceive. That's what Solomon is saying. Don't allow your mouth to be the source of deception, the source of deception. Let me hurry up to close this. I see you don't like this kind of teaching. But if you notice, he's about to make another transition in verse number 29. He's about to make another transition. What is the transition? When Solomon stops talking about one thing so he can start talking about another thing. 
what was the other thing he was talking about in verse number 28? Well, in verse number 28, uh, he was talking about perjury. He was talking about perjury in verse number 28. Now, in verse number uh, verse number 29, he's going to talk about pardon. He's going to talk about pardon. He's going to talk about pardon. Not only is he going to talk about pardon, beloved, he's going to talk about the necessity for forgiveness. You remember what God said. God said, not, not only did God say, Jesus said it as well. Jesus says, if you refuse to forgive your neighbor, if you for, refuse to forgive your brother, then my heavenly Father will not extend forgiveness to you. If you want forgiveness, you're going to have to be willing to give forgiveness. Solomon talks here about pardon. He talks here about pardon. Look at verse number 29, if you will, in the 24th chapter of the book of Proverbs, verse number 29. And let's hear what Solomon has to say to us in these last and evil days. He says, say not, I will do so, so and so to him, as he hath done to me. I will render to the man according to his work emphasis. Say not, I will do so and so to him as he hath done to me. I will render to the man according to what he has done towards me. What he has done towards me. Now, what Solomon is describing here in verse number uh, 29 is the philosophy of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Notice, if you will, the words of Solomon and the words of the one who is suggested to be greater than Solomon, and that's Jesus Christ himself. According to Matthew chapter 12, verse number 42, the Bible describes Jesus as being one who is greater in wisdom than Solomon. Notice what Solomon says, and notice what Solomon says, uh, uh, and how he says what he says. In verse number 29, he says, in no uncertain terms, he says, do not, uh, he says, say not, I will do so to him as he has done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. Notice that Solomon, the wise man, uh, <coughs> tells us in verse 29 what not to do. What not to do. He tells us what not to do. He, he says, never say that I'm going to do evil for evil or I'm going to do to a person exactly what they have done to me. That's what he tells that's what he tells us what not to do. Solomon tells us what not to do. But listen to the one who is greater than Solomon. He doesn't say what not to do. He tells us what we should do. He tells us what we should do. He tells us what we should do. When does he tell us that? In Matthew chapter 7, verse number 12, he says, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Notice the wise man Solomon tells us what not to do, but the one who's greater than Solomon tells us what we should do. We should do unto others. God, I love your word. We should do unto others as we would have others do unto us. These are the words um, um, that we should adhere to. We should hear, adhere to the one who is greater than Solomon. Because Solomon tells us what not to do, 
but Jesus, the one who is greater than Solomon, according to Matthew chapter 7, verse number 12, he tells us what we should do when we find ourselves uh, in a situation where, we seek, where we're seeking revenge. One of the most natural tendencies in life is to seek revenge for something or someone who has wronged us purposely. They have purposely wronged us. And it's a natural tendency to want to seek revenge or to re desire uh, to seek revenge. But we have not so learned from Christ. Even when Jesus was on the cross of Calvary, he didn't seek revenge. He gave them power. You remember what he said on the cross of Calvary? He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Most people said, you don't have to forgive anybody until they ask for forgiveness. Not if we use Jesus as the perfect example for extending forgiveness or extending pardon. Nowhere in the Holy Writ do we find ever that those who Jesus forgave asked for forgiveness. He extended this forgiveness without them asking. So don't wait for other people to ask you for forgiveness before you're willing to extend forgiveness. Because true pardon has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with him. Beloved, I see that my time is well spent. It's far better to have God and not need him than to need God and not have him. If you walk with God, I promise you, my God will walk with you. God bless you till we meet again.